one thing that I hope readers take away, in addition to everything that we've talked about here, is the way that civilians get enmeshed in conflict. Um, this was a war that took place at a time when people thought war was only about soldiers and they fight out in, you know, out in the field somewhere and it doesn't come home to us. That was people's belief. But it, as it turned out, armies were coming through, whether they're the enemy army or their own armies are marching through looking for supplies. And there's no playbook for that. Right. There's no I mean, we think about what's happening, you know, over the last year and a half in Ukraine. There's not a rule book that says this is what you do when enemy soldiers come into town. And um, and so I just uh, would want readers to sort of think about that experience with empathy as they contemplate what war was like 150 years ago. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am very excited to have on the show Rachel Krastel for her new book, Bismarck's War, the Franco-Prussian War and the Making of Modern Europe. Rachel is a professor of history and provost and chief academic officer at Xavier University in Cincinnati and a former Fulbright scholar. She's the author of Organizing for War, The Siege of Strasbourg, and How to Be Childless. Rachel, how are you today? Great. AJ, it's a pleasure to be here. Who could have thought that the Franco-Prussian War could be so interesting or have such big consequences for Europe? Well, exactly. It's one of those wars that before you know about it, you think, oh, it's kind of like all these other, you know, conflicts. When was it? What century? Who? What was going on then? But once you start to dig in, you realize how foundational it was to to Europe in the 20th century, to all the things that we think about um, have, happening, World War I, yeah. World War II, and so on. And do you find that most people in the U.S. know much about the Franco-Prussian War or that there even was a Franco-Prussian War? It is lesser known, for sure. Uh, it is not my leading. You know, when people ask me, "What do I? What do I study?" Um, you know, I'll say modern France or modern Europe. You know, that that time period between the French Revolution and World War One. And then if they, if you know, then I'll sort of get into sort of you know, what do I study? The Franco-Prussian War. Well, why? Why that? You know, that's always a question. But it, it was the biggest conflict between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. It was the biggest conflict in Europe, um, and really set the stage for what was to come. Yeah, and that's um, one that was was very surprising for me to uh, to learn about was where the consequences um, from from this war. But with I, it's so interesting when when talking about the the 19th century in wars in Europe and wars in America. So, for example, the War of 1812 is you know we know what that is here in America, but most people in Europe, 1812 is you know that's Napoleon. That's like what is the War of 1812? There was a war in America in 1812. So this is this this might definitely fall along those lines of you know it's a, a Europe North America divide. Um, but nonetheless, like huge consequences. Absolutely. I mean, so you have on the one hand, you've got France, which at that time had Napoleon III as his emperor, who is lesser known. His uncle was the great Napoleon, right? But he had been the emperor of France for, for 20 years um, and really an authoritarian leader. At the end of this war, France is becoming a republic and a stable republic for the first time ever after many, many revolutionary upheavals. OK, so that's one big change. And it, it becomes the France of like the Eiffel Tower and the Impressionists and, you know, that turn of the century Belle Epoque that emerges out of this war. On the other hand, you've got Germany, right, which at the beginning of this war is is still in many different states. Up until recently, there had been a question of whether Germany would ever unify. If it did, would it be under the leadership of Austria or under the leadership of Prussia? And it, as it turned out, you know, with this conflict, um, Prussia was emerging as that leader. And by the end of this war, there is a unified Germany for the first time um, that had been a long time in process, but becomes the German Empire that, of course, then later um, leads into World War I. So it's a really consequential uh, conflict. Yeah, well, let's let's set the stage then to uh, to 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 dive into 
this war. So this so it takes place from 1870 to 1871. Let's I mean the book is called Bismarck's War. So maybe first let's talk about Bismarck, who is a <clears throat> a huge figure. What kind of person was he? What's his role before this war? Um, and 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 what what is he trying to do that leads to the Franco-Prussian War? Right. So so Otto von Bismarck becomes the German chancellor and really the you know the the political mastermind behind the unification of Germany. So over the previous decade, he had he had been able to shunt money into the armed forces um, and had and and it helped to to support you know the the most powerful army in the world. They didn't know it quite yet because they proved themselves in this war and others during the course of the 1860s. But that is what he was building. And what Bismarck did, he changed nationalism from something that was associated with the left and with revolutionary forces like during the French Revolution to something that was a force on the right and the more like conservative authoritarian monarchical kind of nationalism that's a that's a that's there's a lot to unpack there but basically yeah. what I'll what I'll note is that that for for a long time the forces of the kings the nobility the church and that we think of as associated with conservatism at that time in Europe they tended to view the idea of a unified nation as something that was counter to their interests. They viewed a unified nation as being actually way too embedded in the people to be something that they wanted to see ha- to, to see happen. And they tried very hard to tamp down any attempts at, say, German unity. Germany, of course, was many different states, large, small, little principalities, cities that were independent, you know, all these different units. Well, what happens by the middle of the 19th century is that conservatives, and by, again, by conservative, I'm meaning the, you know, the, the, the church, the, the aristocracy, the monarchy, they start to realize that they can harness the power of nationalism for their own support and to create a unified nation that is both very much under the power of a monarchy and very much rooted in the sort of feeling of national unity that nationalism is so good at creating. And that's what Bismarck managed to harness throughout the 1860s and into 1870. Yeah, well what kind of what kind of person was he? Was he a military guy? What was, you know, what's kind of his background and how did he get into power? So he comes from a, an aristocratic background. He's, you know, was known as a Junger in Prussia. Um, and so um, he he he's not um, he, you know, he wore a, a uniform often, but he was not really a military person. A lot of his uh, the 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 true military leadership in Prussia kind of turned their nose up at him when he would sort of walk around. You there are some portraits of him, you know, wearing the pointed hat, you know, the the helmet and so on. But but he was not um, a military strategist at all. What's so interesting about Bismarck is sometimes people ascribe to him like a a grand plan, a grand scheme of unifying Germany. And yes, he had that. He always had that as the strategic outcome that he was seeking, but he didn't necessarily know exactly what the steps would be to get from here to there. But he was so smart at both taking advantage of whatever came to, came to him to, to strengthen his position and then astutely understanding the um, how he could manipulate um, what had happened in the past. So he he knew, you know, four years earlier that Napoleon III had said something that would come back to haunt him and that he could twist for his own benefit, right? That was the kind of thing that Bismarck was good at. Yeah. And so he, so when, when he comes into power and in the 1860s, he starts several, I don't know if you want to call them wars, and maybe they are wars, but he starts fighting Austria. He, he invades I think, or he fights Denmark. Right. Right. We'll talk about what he's doing in the 1860s. Yeah. So, so the first war is against Denmark and where he and where Prussia and Austria are actually on the same side. Um, And they're, they're fighting Denmark and they claim some territory, um, some of of Danish territory. Then, so that's 1863. And then in 1866, he ends up going to war against Austria, Um, Austria that um, the Habsburg empire, and to to many people's surprise, he ends up Prussia ends up um, severely defeating Austria quickly within the in the field within just a few weeks. That that conflict in 1866 leads 
on the one hand to a pr- political realignment within Austria. So it now becomes Austria-Hungary, the, the, the Magyars who you know, really assert their political power there because the crown there has weakened. And it also means that as a result, the, some of the key independent countries, Bavaria, Württemberg, Baden, who were still independent from Prussia, nevertheless found themselves under Prussian sway. They had to enter into treaties as a result of that. They had sided with Austria um, against Prussia, and now and, and now those are really two the, the two big powers in the German lands, which haven't yet been unified. Right. And as you're saying, Prussia is is in this this is this a new thing that Prussia has, is defeating Austria because they've come into conflict before. Oh sure. It's, yeah. Yeah, for for a long time, but Austria was always so much bigger. They were more established. They had this multi-ethnic uh, empire under their sway, the Habsburg Empire, um, that you know extended all the way, you know, up bordering against Russia down into the Balkans and so on. But 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 Prussia's ability to then defeat them in the field so suddenly was startling um, and and, and signaled a shift. What what do you what 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 is new uh, that Prussia is doing? How are they how are they achieving these victories now? Well, one big thing is that they have universal conscription, which became the norm later in the century. But it was actually Prussia that pioneered that way of conscripting armies. So previously, um, most armies would would conscript men into their armies for long terms of, of service, some seven years, eight years. 25 years, depending on the country. And, and it would be a small subset of men who would be doing the armed services. What Prussia instituted was universal conscription, which meant that every single uh, young man um, would undertake military service for a shorter period of time. And then they would enter into a, a reserve system so they could be called back up to fight if needed. So that meant that that Prussia over the years had built up a much, much broader number of, of soldiers. So they're not as well trained. They're not as experienced as the, as the, as the smaller conscript armies. And so that's the trade-off. Um, but in, as it turned out at this particular moment in time, that was the more powerful army. But they were also, you know, they, they were very astute about um, war games, um, about mobilization. They were, they were really paying attention to mobilization as a distinct part of uh, entering into a conflict. Like, how do you get men from here to there? How do you concentrate them in one location? How do you make sure they all have the arms that they need and the supplies that they need? Um, how do you use the railroads effectively? Not just not so much because the railroads are speedier, but because the railroads are more consistent and allow your troops to arrive fresher and more ready to fight. And I think the the military leadership right now is under uh, Helmut von Moltke. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Exactly. And, and so, what is he bringing? Uh, just thinking about the military situation, what is he bringing that is is more innovative than uh, some of the people he's fighting against? Well, for one thing, he's he conceptualizes the ability to mobilize large armies in a way that others had not yet even begun to think about. So he imagines um, the ability for armies to to move into space, to um, to have to to wrap around their enemies and to outflank them, and that that flanking maneuver, because the armies have now gotten so big, you have to you have to actually um, structure your mobilization around it so that you're moving them into the right spots. You can't just like have them all go in the same direction and then kind of split out. You have to actually mobilize them in the right way so they can eventually um, surround and you know and crush the other army. So he's he's very thoughtful about that. And um, yeah, so, so Prussia had much stronger leadership than Austria at the time, and that proves to be the case um, in, in the conflict against France later. So, so that war happens. And, and again, at this point, so now, by now, the South German states are kind of strong armed into being into alliances with Prussia. And then the, the Northern German states, so everything except Austria, basically, are, um, are now part of what's called the North German Confederation. And so that's a confederation of German states under the leadership of Prussia, uh, with, with King Wilhelm, the, you know, the, the first of, of Prussia at the, as the monarch, and then Bismarck as the, um, as the minister president who is leading um, leading this confederation. So um, in 1870, what happens is that it's pretty clear that Prussia still wants to bring in the southern German states. So again, that's like Bavaria, that's Baden, that's Württemberg. They want to bring those states into line with them even closer and have some kind of um, unification. And it's not going to happen by 
conquering them, right? Bismarck is not interested in marching into Bavaria, marching into Munich, you know, and taking this area. He's interested in creating the circumstances whereby they will have a shared victory. And it's through shared victory that he will win over the Bavarians and uh, on the sort of hearts and minds level. Yeah. But then it also will then force the negotiation, uh, the Bavarian monarch um, and, and the Bavarian politicians who who clearly are, you know, are feeling the pinch between, you know, with this, this strong northern um, border. Yeah. Yeah. And that that seemed like such a uh, I mean, now, I mean, of course, having had several nationalist conflicts since this time, it, it seems a little bit obvious, but that did seem like kind of a, a maybe a, a, an ingenious strategy on Bismarck's part. It's, you know, why invade them when we can actually have them fight with us um, and, exactly. and get this sense of, of unity from on, on the, the ground level? And he'd already, um, I, you know, the, their treaties had already gotten, you know, he had placed high level military leaders in the in the Bavarian military. So like so the, the pieces were there for sure. Now, would you say this is in this is my last question about Germany for now, because then I want to ask about France and, and leading up. But would, would you say this is maybe the the birth of of nationalism at this point? Was there were there popular nationalist movements among German speaking peoples before this? There had been. There had been. And most notably, the revolution of 1848. So about 20 years earlier, like a generation earlier, had been a big moment of of folks. But coming from like, not from the sort of Bismarck monarch side of things, but more from the like popular democracy side of things. So there had been movements to try and unify Germany, but to unify it under a democracy, small, de you know, Democrats, People saying, "Okay, let's vote. Let's have a parliament. Let's have elected officials." You know, and they and they gathered in 1848 after this revolutionary movement sweeps across Europe, and it sweeps across the you know everywhere from from France um, all the way across Europe. It, it touches basically everywhere except for Britain and Russia. So it's a it, it's a cross continental um, revolutionary moment, but eventually it's crushed by the monarchs who are like, "No way, we are not going to be the monarchs of this you know sort of popular movement," um, and and so that's before. Before Bismarck makes that shift to saying, okay, there, there should be a conservative nationalism. And so what's interesting is when you when you look at um, you know, sort of the letters of some some like let's say lawyers or politicians, lower level politicians, um, they might say, look, we know Bismarck is is just manipulating this. But boy, this is exciting, you know. Like, but, but you know, so so they kind of you kind of see a shift in their attitudes toward um, to a unified Germany over time because of this shared victory. Well, let's pivot a little bit to France mm -hmm. and specifically Napoleon III, who is an interesting character. And I think for somebody who doesn't know this conflict or really what was going on at all in France in the, the latter part of the 19th century, you hear the name Napoleon. So, of course, there's some association there with the first Napoleon. Uh, but now we're at, at the third Napoleon, which I think a lot of people might not even know there was a third Napoleon. Uh, talk, talk first about how how Napoleon the third came to be in power, and, sure. uh, and then talk about maybe the military situation in France. Yeah, so Napoleon the third, who again he's the he's the nephew of the great Napoleon. There was never a Napoleon the second on the on the throne. Um, that was Napoleon's son who died, you know, without ever actually exerting power. But um, but they, you know, if you're a true believer, you know, you you. You see him as Napoleon II. So Napoleon III had spent much, much of his youth outside of France. Um, he was in exile. He was exiled as a, as a member of the Bonaparte family after the fall of Napoleon. He spent a lot of time in Britain. And he had had some attempts at trying to, to grab power. Um, in, in fact, he had been in prison in France for trying to sort of come back and, and grab power. But he, what, when he really comes onto the political scene is following that revolution of 1848. So it happened in France too. At that time, France had a branch of the monarchy called the Orleanists were on the throne. Sometimes people don't realize that after Napoleon fell, um, what was reinstituted were monarchies. So there was the return of the Bourbons after 1815. And then after they were overthrown in 1830, the, the Orleanist um, uh, monarchs uh, came to the throne in eight, or came to the throne in 18, 1830. So um, by 1848, France had been a monarchy again for um, 
for over 30 years. So 1848, um, this revolutionary moment sweeps across um, Europe. In France, the monarch is deposed. There's never again a sitting monarch um, in, in France. And uh, a second republic is declared. There had been a first republic during the Great Revolution, and now there's a second republic. That republic decides to hold elections, um, as republics do, right? They're, they're, they're all about elected officials um, you know, that are they're elected by, by the people in some way, shape, or form. So who do they elect as president in December of 1848 but Louis Napoleon Bonaparte? That is to say, the future Napoleon III. He has name recognition. He's seen as a strong leader outside of Paris, where people are less, you know, less radical, although there certainly are a lot of people um, who believe in small d democracy outside of Paris. But um, but that name resonated and some of the more popular leftists from Paris did not resonate. And so he's elected president. Well, three years later, um, he decides his time is right and he um, crushes the republic. He arrests all the republican leaders, again, small r, uh, republic. Um, he arrests them. They go into exile. And so he then declares himself as emperor um, a year later in 1852. So that's, uh, to me, always a, a very interesting. Um, yeah. Question. And I think just thinking about, I mean, democracy, you know, time and again, in the, the the 19th and 20th centuries, somehow people are elected into democracy who aren't aren't fans of democracy, and this is one of those situations. Did was this were 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 Napoleon the Third's authoritarian tendencies were those well known before he was elected? He he actually was tried to claim speaking for the, the sort of the people, sort of, again, this like populism that undergirds authoritarianism often. So you see that in him. He w- he claimed to be sort of like this, you know, supporter of the working person, which resonated again with the revolutionary moment of, of 1848. But, but, you know, over the course of it, after he's elected and, you know, it's, he's, he's dismantling the Republic in, in his various actions. So he becomes an authoritarian leader. He stifles dissent. He stifles uh, free press. Um, he stifles civic involvement. But nevertheless, I mean, that generation of 1848, although many were dispersed, imprisoned, exiled, and so on, Victor Hugo is one of the most famous in ex- people in exile for you know who, who stayed abroad for over 20 years. But they nevertheless, you know, they. Maybe they come back to their cities. Maybe they're not um, able to typically serve in government. Um, they might try, but then to be like, say, a mayor or a municipal councilman, but they typically get disbanded or, you know, like pushed out of power as soon as they try to do anything. But they are lawyers, they are doctors, they are, you know, civic leaders in different ways. And so they're still yeah. present. And he yeah. was not an unpopular leader either, right? He He did have a lot of support from. From the French public, absolutely. I mean, he was also very economically. You know, he 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 made a lot of investment in the economy. Um, he was a proponent of free trade, which was a, a big you know a big shift at the time. He concluded a treaty with Britain so that they had a free trade agreement, which was a big deal. And he was also a big builder of things like canals and railroads, and so that you know infrastructure expansion was important to France at that time. And by the 1860s, he's he's savvy enough to think that he might need to loosen some things in order to keep that sort of to keep that Republican moderate base um, on his side, or at least quiet the opposition. So um, he does loosen a little bit in terms of press and uh, ability to, for people to to meet. But that's something. That <laughs> sure, something interesting that. Most people don't, most Americans probably don't know about Napoleon III, if they know about him, um, but he seemed to side a lot. This is the 1860s, so the U.S. Civil War is going on at this time. And he seemed to side a lot with the Confederacy, which didn't actually make him very popular uh, in the 1870s uh, in America. Why was why was Napoleon III, why was he, uh, at least personally, uh, an ally of the Confederacy? Well, he's looking to Mexico, right? So when he, as he's trying to do his different, um, he's very keenly aware that he has not had the great military victories that his uncle has had. 
So that's a big part of the decisions that he makes, you know, for, for his entire life. And so he's seeking places where he can exert power and influence. And one of those is Mexico. So he's he's seeking to prop up the um, Emperor Maximilian in, in Mexico. And so to do that, he needs he wants to um, he, he'd rather see the Confederate the Confederacy be successful and to you know, antagonize the North. So he has he has no particular you know love for the North. So certainly, you know, in 1870, when the when the Franco-Prussian War breaks out, the Americans are like, why would we support this guy? You know, he, he, you know, the Northerners are like, we, this is these, he's obviously our enemy. And uh, the German American presence was so great, right? If you think about all the immigrants uh, from Europe to, to the United States from, from the German States. Um, so Germany seemed much more sort of um, closely attuned and they didn't know a whole lot about Prussia and about Prussian politics or about Bismarck. And so they were like, yeah, they, they seem more, you know, uh, akin to who we are. Well, let's, Let's real quick before we dive into the actual like the the immediate causes of the war. Um, let's talk about the military situation in France. What what's what's the army like in France? What uh, what's going on militarily in the eighteen sixties in France under Napoleon the Third? Well, um, so he so in France they have they they don't have the universal conscription and that comes later. But instead they have an, an army that features um, longer serving uh, servicemen who. Some of them are serving overseas. They, you know, participated in the Crimean War. Some of them are participating in conquering colonies in Africa, uh, for example. So, so that's where they tend to be to be located. They are not as well. They're they're they tend to rely on sort of like their their experience and their sort of roughness, their kind of sense of like being being tough guys who who kind of groan and moan but but get the job done. The army does have um, really good technology in terms of their rifles, the Chassepo, which is something that they had adopted in the 1860s. It's the it's the best rifle out there. Um, uh, breech loading, you know, can shoot a mile away. You know, very accurate. The Prussians, um, on the other hand, had the better cannon, um, similarly rifled cannon. So, you know, there there's some different um, military strengths there. But what was the leadership in the French army was not particularly strong and they were not as um, the organ, the Napoleon the third did not have great allies. He had ma not managed to, to secure allies and keep allies. There's, you know, again, th these are instances where Bismarck, you know, would take a letter out from four years ago and be like, remember this. And then the allies would be like, Oh yeah, we're not going to touch France anymore. You know? So like, so it was very hard for France to get allies. They did not have, um, strong war plans. They relied on the idea that maybe they could get Austria if they were to go to war against Prussia, because everyone was predicting this, right? By the after 1866, 1867, the war between Prussia and Austria, everyone kind of knew the next war was probably going to be between France and Prussia. But um, France thought, well, we'll try to get Austria on our side. We'll try to get Italy on our side. That never materialized. So they didn't have allies. They didn't have plans. They didn't have a great leadership structure. And just as in um, in 1870, as this war crisis starts to heat up, Napoleon III changes his entire military structure, which, as you can imagine, means not just refocusing armies from here to there, but the leadership structure. Who do you report to? How do you? Where are you going to maneuver? Everything. I think you said there are three armies that he basically just throws into one. Yeah, enormous army, right? Exactly, exactly. And so that um, that causes enormous confusion. And so, yeah, yeah. After well, the, after the after the war is declared, they're 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 a much messier operation than the Prussians. Well, let's talk about the immediate uh, causes. Uh, what really just uh, gets this war going, uh, and it it's a really interesting tale of diplomatic shrewdness um, that involves Spain. Mm -hmm. Could you could you tell? that story for the audience? Sure. So, so the war is precipitated by, of all things, succession to the throne in Spain. And when uh, there's, a, there's a, a vacancy in the throne, the Prussian family proposes one of their own, a Hohenzollern, to be the king of Spain. And when France hears this, they think, absolutely not. We will not be encircled by, you know, this, you know, this family, uh, you know, to the south, as well as to the north and east. Like, absolutely not. So they demand. And this is, 
this is something that this is a tradition established under the the Habsburgs. What, how how does this um, this kind of rule? How is how is that a thing? Sure. I mean, back during the time of Louis the Fourteenth in France, you know, like his big concern was that he had Habsburgs to the south in in Spain. There is Habsburgs to the east in you know what is Austria, and then Habsburgs even to the north in the Low Countries. And so, like, so so this concern about being encircled is something that France was very familiar with. And so they don't want it coming from the Prussians um, either, you know. And so, and so, what year is this, by the way, that the Spanish monarch dies? Uh, eighteen sixty-eight. Eighteen sixty-eight. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is unfolding for a little while, right? And and then, um, and so there's a proposal for a um, well, it's, it's precipitated by a number of changes within Spain, um, and uh, and so they're they're trying to put on the um, so so after this Hohenzollern is proposed Leopold to be the king of Spain. France is like, absolutely not. And they get very angry and they, and they're very publicly angry about it. So the, the foreign minister and the, the ambassador to Prussia and so on, like they're all very publicly upset about this and talking about it in the legislative core. And it gets out in the press because again, Napoleon III had loosened the press to a certain degree. And so, and so, you know, this is always the, the issue that authoritarians face. If they do anything to loosen, um, of course, people are very critical of them or, or if things go in a way that they can't control anymore, um, then their, their, their hold on power becomes lessened. And so, so, so in France, there's a lot of anger and upsetness uh, about this proposal from Prussia. Okay, so, so Prussia says, okay, we, will, we won't do that. You know, we, don't, we, we withdraw this proposal. But then... But then the, the the French are so, you know, sort of in this moment that they say, well, actually, we would like for you to promise that you will not only withdraw it, but that you will never propose this person again. And that is a bridge too far, right? No sovereign nation is going to agree to never make a proposal, right? They're, they, they are never going to say, oh, sure, we'll handcuff ourselves for the future, right? So, so that's, not, that's, not a, um, that's not a realistic request. Um, the French... Um, the French ambassador to Prussia meets the king in um, in in at, he's out on holiday in Bad Ems and he is um, he is approached by the French uh, ambassador Benedetti and and he politely rebuffs him you know no we're not going to make this we're not going to agree to this well you know that's fine and 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 the the original telegram coming from the the Prussian royalty front you know for, to 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 make this statement of you know refusal we won't we won't agree to never p- propose the candidacy again is you know polite has all the nice words all the niceties that you would want to expect bismarck gets a hold of this telegram and he cuts out all the niceties so that by the time it hits the french and then gets very quickly out into the french public it is rude and it is just like absolutely not Right. It's it's the kind of statement that just rankles. And it and so instead of letting the conflict die away, Bismarck manipulates the situation so that the French now really have very little recourse, especially in this sort of high honor kind of society. They are not going to back down. And so the French declare war on Prussia in mid July of 1870. And they they go to war two weeks later. They're they're actually in the field fighting two weeks later. Which again seems like on Bismarck's part such a such a clever move because had Bismarck invaded France, uh, there wouldn't have that sense of unity might not have uh, have have existed. But now the German people are being attacked is how it's uh, is being portrayed. Exactly. And so war war is war is announced. And how do how do Germans feel once once France declares war? You know, okay, so that's always a hard question, right? How do Germans feel, right? So there's some who are like, absolutely, this is great. You know, like we feel so so mad, we're or we're you know we've been offended and we're gonna go. Others are like, we know Bismarck is manipulating this, but as I said before, but okay, this this still feels pretty good. It's really hard to say. There are no like scientific polling in the 1870. All you had can go on is the press, and the press was very controlled by the monarchy. Like Bismarck had his finger on most of the press. So there are some newspapers that at first would say, well, wait a minute, we're not so sure about this war, but they were very quickly shunted to the side. In France, similar, although the, there's more space for opposition at this point um, in France, and you can you can sometimes see that in the press, but not, you know, for the most part, the press um, is reflecting uh, the state's interests. 
So it's hard to, you, you could never say like this percentage of the population supported it and this percentage didn't. Um, you have to go by, you know, your best, your best understanding of the different sources out there. People are in, in both Germany and France, though, so there, there, there seems to be a, an outpouring of like, yeah, like we're going to go show them. And, you know, there's, there's fervor. And, and I got the impression that, that, that war was something that people favored. I don't know if we can say that for sure, but was that at least the, the impression that, that, that you had? Yeah, I think in the first couple of weeks, right, as mobilization is happening, most people are like, yep, we're going to go do this. We're, we are either anywhere from like we're, we are resigned to doing this to actual enthusiasm. And so you see a lot of that enthusiasm when soldiers, you know, are mobilizing, they have to show up at their railroad, you know, so crowds come out to cheer them and to, you know, give them gifts or give them food or what or give them wine, you know, as they get on the trains. Um, so that all works really well. You know, that those first weeks of mobilization are very exciting. Where things start start to shift for France is that their mobilization was so disorganized. They were going crisscrossing the country, sometimes not knowing exactly where to go, not necessarily knowing where their superiors were, not necessarily going to the same location as the supplies that they needed. And so because of this, the the French morale starts to to wane, you know, pretty quickly. So there's there's you, it, it kind of depends where you are, right? You know, and if you're if you're in a border town, you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, what's about to come? So there, it depends on exactly where you live. Well, let's talk about the first, uh, the opening of of this war, the first um, the first battle. Uh, talk about how that unfolds. Sure. So the so the very first battle is a skirmish where the French actually invade into the German states. August 2nd of 1870, they go in. It's a very, very short battle. They, they claim a village for a brief amount of time. Um, it's the only incursion onto German uh, territory, um, but they had really no plan for what they were going to do from there. And so very quickly they retreat back over the border. It's a couple of days later that you start to have um, a few battles, uh, first in Alsace and then also in Lorraine. There's, a, there's some two key, two key battles that happen to happen, have, happen at, on the very same day, August 6th. One in Lorraine, which is you know toward the east, and then Alsace, which is right on the eastern border of France. And those neither of those battles were well planned. They were they were kind of stumbled into. Um, keep in mind, it's 1870, so you don't have um, you have telegrams. You can communicate that way, but you don't have amplification. Uh, you don't have radar. You don't have you know you don't have reconnaissance beyond what you can do on horseback for the most part. So so it's really hard to actually know where the enemy is. And you have to, you know, you, you sometimes you run into each other and then you kind of find yourself actually having a, a battle. And if nobody backs down, then suddenly you're engaged in a fight and more people start to kind of run to the guns um, and then a battle actually ensues. So in both of those cases on August 6th, it could have gone either way. There were close battles, but in the, at the end of the day, it was the Prussians who were victorious. So when that happens, suddenly the door is blown open. So now Prussia is able to come into into France and start to you know to to move into the interior, um, and that really sets up then uh, the major battles that happen in mid August and at the very start of September. Well, let's talk about some of the the more significant moments um, then from the the actual fighting. Is, all right, can you can you walk us through some of those moments? Sure. Uh, there's a series of battles that happen around the city of Metz in middle in the middle of August, and those are battles that that again for the most part the first two were not really planned. August 14th, August 16th, and then August 18th was finally a, a planned pitch battle um, that extended across for miles. Um, and and at this point, um, again because they were fighting in multiple sectors throughout, throughout the course of the day, they were not sure whether they would be uh, who 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 was really winning. Um, there were sectors in which Prussia was clearly being trapped in a in a ravine, and were we just were not able to advance. But there were other. What are the areas. size of both of these armies, too? By the way. Oh yeah, yeah. Time. So we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands um, in you know in these armies. So in the army, you know, two million soldiers were engaged in in the entirety of the war in six months. Um, so so a vast size, much bigger than had happened in Austria in the Austro-Prussian War four years ago, four years earlier. But the armies in the field tended to be, you know, maybe 100,000 uh, men at the, the largest might meet in a battle. So, um, so, so they are large. They are, they're not things that you can see the entirety of, of the battle in one place. 
you have commanders kind of trying to go behind the scenes on horseback to try and understand what's happening. And so, um, and you also, because of the, the, the weaponry, you could have fighting where the rifles are so far back that you don't even see them. You don't even see the soldiers you're fighting against. So this is not like muskets where you have to see the whites of their eyes before you shoot. You can be very, very far back and have a rifle shooting and it can be a mile away um, and be effective. So so it's, it, it's, it's starting to feel a little more random and a little more like it actually, there's a, a heightened sense of, of, of snipers could be anywhere. Um, and so, so whether you're in the battle or you're marching, um, you don't know where the the uh, the next um, threat is going to come from. What what also is characteristic of battles in the Franco-Prussian War is the use of cannon, and again, that's where Prussia really excelled. So, it, what would often happen is it wouldn't be the start of the day where the cannon would be effective because they would have to be brought into place. But by midday or by the end of the day, the cannon would be set up in these long lines um, and and then be able to shoot into the field. Um, and that would often be what what turned the, the tide for Prussia. So a lot of da- these days- so you say the, the cannon, the artillery, yeah. has really made a huge difference in this war. It did. It did. And what, what's interesting is you start to see the power of the defense. Um, actually, like the, the the ability to to sort of trench in into a spot and and prevent people from moving forward is what you start to see in this conflict. Um, there is actually later in the war. Um, there's a, there's one particular battle, like uh, small, you know, s- small in the course of the war, but significant in history, where um, where where the um, where the where people start to learn how to like maneuver around these strong defenses, but it's completely forgotten. Uh, and so it has to be relearned in World War I. Um, but, it, but, but you know, that, that's sort of a crucial moment. In any case, um, the, the, str- the strength of the rifles for the French, the strength of the cannon for the Prussians, um, sometimes some just luck of who showed up when um, and, and, and sort of held on. Um, some, there were moments in these mid-August battles where if the French had just continued to fight, they would have pressed their advantage and they might have been victorious on the day. Um, there were instances where the French seemed to have won, but because they didn't have supplies sort of at the next stage, because of, again, the disorganization of their their um, their mobilization, they had to pull back anyway. So the, so the French end up uh, pull, being back on their heels um, in the middle of August. Um, and they're split. So so but at this point, um, basically one part of their army has bottled up in the city of Metz and the other army is kind of marching but somewhere between Paris and the Belgian border. And they're trying to figure out, like, where is that army in Metz? They can't communicate with them. Right. Where where are they? Can we meet up? Can we, you know, in, can can we you know join join up and push the Prussians out? They're not sure what to do. They're seeking supplies and they end up through this kind of zigzag progress. They end up right at the border with Belgium near the city of Sedan, which is an old fortress city, really not a strong fortress at this point, but it's an old fortress city now in, you know, the sort of um, uh, ironworking area of the of the country. And it's there that the Prussians and the French have their their big battle. Napoleon III is there. He's present with his army. And on September 1, those two armies join around Sedan. The Germans are, are encircling the city, coming up from uh, on, the, on the east side. They're heading north. On the west side, they're heading north. They meet in the middle. They didn't even realize that they were, that's what they were doing. But when they meet and they realize, wait a minute, that's some of our guys on the other side. And they realize, oh, my gosh, we have completely encircled the French who are within the fortress city. And their cannon now are in place to rain down on the French. And so by that afternoon, the French are, are they're trapped. They're, they're actually getting hit by multiple sides. And Napoleon III is right in the middle of that. So by the end of that day, um, Napoleon III has to surrender. And um, he, he decides to surrender so, so again, that's basically his army. The other part of the army is now bottled up in Metz, completely surrounded. But he doesn't surrender the country. He just says, I am surrendering myself and this army that's present right here, I am not surrendering for France. So he surrenders, he ends up, he ends up escaping out, but he's but he basically he's he's politically ruined. Um, his army is 80,000 men are captured. They're sent as prisoners of war back to Germany to, to, to various camps. But France has not given up. 
So the war is only six weeks old. The leader is captured. Their armies are captured. But the country does not give up. And so what happens in Paris, all those folks who had been waiting for decades for Napoleon III to, you know, to, to depart, who had been hoping for this moment, declare, now we are a republic. Now we are overthrowing this regime finally. But we have to keep fighting. Well, one of the things that you write about is that this war, um, these events as they unfolded, completely reshaped Europe. Talk about why that is. Yeah. So as a result, um, so France fights on, you know, they're, they're eventually defeated, that, that new republic. But, but Napoleon does not come back, right? That new republic, nevertheless, manages to, um, there's all kinds of ins and outs to this story, right? But, but eventually, um, though, those leaders that, and these, you might say, moderate republicans, they're not radicals. They're not the ones out in the streets. Believe me, there's plenty of, of radicals who are trying to claim power too in France. And there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of revolutionary activity in that in that on that side. But the moderate Republicans end up being the ones who hold on to power. And after kind of crushing their enemies on all sides, they they establish a republic. Um, and so from the early 1870s onward, um, all the way up, all the way through World War One, right? The French Republican state, the French Republic. Stays you know, all through the challenges of World War One, through that victory, won at a terrible cost, um, all the way up until 1940 is that same republic, um, the Third Republic. They only finally, after they're invaded by the Nazis, they vote themselves out of existence and become the Vichy regime. But that's a totally different story. So you've got the republic on the one hand, German side. As the German uh, victories are are unfolding, meanwhile Bismarck is running all kinds of negotiations with the monarchies, with the you know trying to play Bavaria off of Württemberg and you know off of Baden to negotiate their agreement to become part of the German Empire. And, and so, and we didn't. We should clarify too that although we were talking about Prussia invading France, along with the Prussian army were soldiers from Bavaria and from these these other states. So they were all fighting for the same cause. Exactly. And so that's where that sort of emotional sense of connectedness is, is occurring. And I find in the, in the book, I explore particularly some Bavarian soldiers and what their experiences were like and how they, you know, they're, the Bavaria is traditionally seen as sort of like these countrified, you know, backwards uh, state. And so, uh, so the, you know, the Prussians are looking down at them, but at the same time, they're like, but we are all Germans. So we're all on the same side. So it's in um, in January of 1871. While the war is still happening, by this time, Prussian leadership and all its entourage, all the princes, all the ambassadors, and so on, they have landed in the Palace of Versailles. So that French, you know, key locus of power. You know, we think of the Hall of Mirrors. We think of Louis the Fourteenth. You know, they have taken over the. The Palace of Versailles, and it's in that palace in January of 1871 that the German Empire is officially declared. So that is a powerful moment. It's cold, it's drafty, you know. It's, it's many commenters said it was the most. It was a cold ceremony, you know, kind of joyless, and yet um, th this was the moment where they declare um, the German Empire. Um, and ten days later, they are, are concluding the peace. Uh, with France, or they're they're negotiating the armistice with France to to bring the war finally to an end. But you will notice that between September and January, that's a lot of months of continual fighting, both sides feeling ground down by the 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 continuation of the war. But the French did not want to give up. They did not want to cede any territory. But in the end, in the end, um, they were forced to give up um, Alsace and part of Lorraine, those places where the first early battles took place and those territories became part of the German empire. Yeah. And what, what, what's, what was the casualty count like, um, during this, this war? Well, um, so on the French side, for instance, there were 140,000, uh, deaths. Um, many of them were due to disease rather than in battle, but 140,000, um, 40 years later during world war one, there were 1.4 million French soldiers who died. Um, in the course of the war. So the actual rates were pretty similar in terms of the, the length of time. So Franco-Prussian War is, um, you know, is less than six months um, and 140,000 died. So yeah. quite, not, quite a, not a small number of, of people. 
not not at all um uh, but it because it didn't last as long it doesn't have that same sort of like hold on on memory but um but it was very bloody it was um there was a lot of disease and it was a time when people were more interested in in noting the personal sacrifice of soldiers. So, like during the Napoleonic War, you know, millions and millions of soldiers died. You know, during the twenty years of that extended conflict um, that started with the French Revolution and went all the way to Waterloo, most of those soldiers were marked in a nameless grave. Um, during the Franco-Prussian War, most of those soldiers, when they fell, were reburied in personal graves, or they were their names were captured, their names were taken. Prussia uh, instituted the dog tag uh, for yeah, the first time. They invented right? the dog tag. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the name of the soldier was important, right? Knowing where that person had fallen, being able to report back to the families, that started to be an important part of what it meant to go to war. And so that sort of culture of memory um, originates in. Um, into a in, in a more mass sense during the Franco-Prussian War. Yeah. And so you've got, now you've got a unified Germany, meaning that, or after the war, it leads to a unified Germany, meaning that now Bavaria and, and Württemberg uh, and Baden, like that it's, we, that is more, that now more closely resembles the Germany that we know today. Mm -hmm. And of course, that sets the stage then for World War One. Right. Um, one of the things that you write in your book that I, I think is very interesting is uh, for the Franco-Prussian War. The question was not just why the Great War, meaning World War I, drew in all the great powers, but why the Franco-Prussian War did not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Yeah. So, I mean, we all are maybe familiar with the, that you know, that summer of 1914, where a conflict in um, Sarajevo, you know, an assassination there, sudden, you know, over time brings in uh, millions and millions of people. But what happens in the Franco-Prussian War is that is that the great powers decided they didn't want any part of it. They didn't want to be drawn in on France's side because they didn't think they were going to be successful. Um, they didn't want to see Prussia become too powerful. So one of the dynamics at work during the, this entire conflict is that Bismarck is trying to bring this um, to a close, but he wants to do it on his terms. The other great powers are trying to bring it to a close on their terms that would be less, you know, less um, for, for Prussia. They don't want to see Prussia become this huge dominant power. Russia is trying to use this as a way to gain back territory they had lost in Crimea. Familiar story, right? So they're so so they're taking advantage of it. Britain doesn't want to have any part of it, but they are watching Belgium. Interesting, which again is a very 1914 kind of a story. They're like, if they go into Belgium, we might have to intervene. That doesn't happen, um, but it but it could have happened, right? It could have been a different story. So. So, you know, it, it's things could have happened. There, there, there's some of the same dynamics are at work in 1870. They just happen to break in a different way. So that that leads it to be, you know, just between these two great powers. How instrumental do you think Bismarck was in preventing something bigger like World War One from from happening in 1870? Right. He had no interest in, in making that happen. And, and, and after the Franco-Prussian War, he certainly didn't want to seek another conflict. He was like, OK, we've achieved our goal. We've got this unified Germany and it's uh, you know bigger than Germany is today, you know, extending both, further both west and east. And so um, and so he's he's all about reigning in conflict at this point. He he understands very clearly the danger of Germany being encir being encircled uh, by Russia and France. He does not want a two front war. Of course, that's exactly what Germany ends up being in in 1914. But under Bismarck's watch, um, he he was crucial in making sure that that did not happen. And he was, you know, during 1870, he's like, of course, I don't want Austria to come in, you know. So he's, he's making it clear to Austria how, you know, how you know they will not uh, they will not benefit from siding with France. I think just thinking about World War One and and what led up to that. Do you think if if there was a Bismarck in power in 1914, do you think it would have been such a global uh, conflict? There are certainly so many times when different decisions could have been made, right? Um, it did, there was nothing inevitable about World War One becoming a global conflict. Um, absolutely not. We you know we we can maybe sort of say, oh, they had these allies or alliances that were entangling. They didn't require 
every country to go to war. Like that was that the, the different decisions could have been made. And so somebody like Bismarck um, very well might have made decisions that would have prevented World War One. So what do you think some of the, the other major consequences are um, from the Franco-Prussian War? Well, one certainly is that um, that all major powers in Europe um, adopted universal conscription with the exception of Britain, um, who did not do so until 1916. Um, so they, they adopt that universal conscription model, which changes uh, the lives of millions and millions of European men. It changes sort of what their expectations are for what their life will be, what how they will spend their 20s, um, you know, what the, the barracks that are built, uh, the sort of military, m- militarized culture that, that evolves during that time. Um, that's that's huge and I think should not be understated um, when we think about our own lives and expectations. Of course, the you know, unified Germany is big. Um, the man who would become Wilhelm II, um, who is, of course, the Kaiser the, during World War I, he's a he's a, an adolescent during this this war. He's the grandson of the king. His father is a is a military leader who ends up being emperor just for a year. And then he, he dies and, and uh, William II becomes emperor. And so it, during the whole war, it's, there's all these ironic quotes of his father saying, oh, my, I think of my son. I hope that his world is a better world and that kind of thing. So that, set, that sets that up. Um, but the one thing that I, I haven't mentioned is the, the, um, the sort of leftist revolution that happens in France right after this war, which is known as the Paris Commune. Now, the Paris Commune was a short-lived time period where the people of Paris rose up to try to claim their own independence. Um, they, I, I've mentioned the sort of moderate Republicans that end up coming into power. Well, there's a there's a, a left group, a further to the left group that is, you know, radical worker based, you know, neighborhood based radicalism, saying we the people should own, you know, should should um, run the country. We should have a say. We should directly, um, you know, have democracy and and decide what our fate is going to be. So. So they and they feel disrespected by this new government. So there's multiple parties going on. In other words, it's very complicated. But soon after the war ends, people of Paris who have suffered through this war for months and months, they've starved, they've been through you know cold weather, you know, very, very cold weather. And they've had you know a decade of building up because of the loosening that Napoleon III do. They have clubs, they have neighborhood groups, you know, all the all these different factors. Um, they declare themselves independent, and for two months they hold on to that independence, but they are crushed by their own army, some of whom had just been crushed by Par- by Prussia. They and the so it's a French civil war that happens in the spring of 1871, and and so the the outcome of that is both on the one hand the left is is crushed uh, for for a, a good while and on the other hand that memory of you know the city rising up for itself is not one that is going to go away um, and so that that sets the stage for some of the conflicts in france in the 1890s well uh rachel this has been a fascinating interview um thank you for your your insightful answers to my questions um kind of lastly here what are you hoping that readers uh, take away when they read your book? You know, one thing that one thing that I hope readers take away, in addition to everything that we've talked about here, is the way that civilians get enmeshed in conflict. Um, this was a war that took place at a time when people thought war was only about soldiers, and they fight out in you know out in the field somewhere, and it doesn't come home to us. That was people's belief. But it, as it turned out, armies were coming through, whether they're the enemy army or their own armies are marching through looking for supplies. And there's no playbook for that. Right. There's no I mean, we think about what's happening you know, over the last year and a half in Ukraine. There's not a rule book that says this is what you do when enemy soldiers come into town. And um, and so I just uh, would want readers to sort of think about that experience with empathy as they contemplate what war was like 150 years ago. Wonderful. Well, um, Rachel, if if folks want to stay in touch with your work, if they want to um, keep up with what you've got going on, where can they, are you on social media? How can they stay in touch with you? Um, They can find out what I'm up to on rachelcrastle.com. And of course, wherever books are sold. Wonderful. Um, Well, uh, Rachel Crastle, Bismarck's War, the Franco-Prussian War, and the Making of Modern Europe, 
Uh, go buy a copy. Go check it out from your library. What an interesting tale. And uh, Rachel, thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure, AJ. Great talking with you.